Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. A very similar illustration is one I've shared here before, but I think it's very important because this is a real, real illustration, real life illustration. Many years ago, one of the richest gold mines in America happened to be out in the Rocky Mountains area. A man decided to take what little money that he had and he bought a burrow, he bought an axe, he bought himself a pan, he bought all that was necessary for him with his claim to go after this gold. And he worked that gold mine, not for weeks, not for months, but for a few years. And all he got was just a few little flakes of gold. Finally, he gave up. He gave up in so much desperation and frustration that he didn't even sell his burrow. He just said, you want it, you can have my burrow, my my pickaxe, everything that I have, I'm walking away from it. A group of guys took that, took his claim, literally, true story, six inches, they struck the richest gold mine in America's history. And so in some cases, I'm wondering how many pastors quit their church if they just stayed a little bit longer. How many people would have stayed with their family, what God could have done? How many would have stayed with the ministries or the jobs or the profession? Now, I'm not talking again about those that are against odds that God would not want you to be a part. But when you know it's God's will, stay with it. You could just be six inches, six days, six hours away from a very unique sovereign blessing by God. Keep that in mind. Well, now, how do I prevent this burnout of this feeling from from quitting? You'll notice in your outline, I put in big black words there, God says. Now, before I tell you what God says, I want to hone in on this for a moment. I don't want you to think that this is a pop psychology. I'm not getting this out of some Christian psychology book. I'm not getting this out of some little three points in a poem situation. I want you to know that God does know that we are wired, that at times we get so disillusioned, we get discouraged, we get discontent, and at times we want to disassociate from life and other things, that we just want to shudder and die. I only wonder how many people committed suicide because they're in that state. And yet God over here says, I love you. And Satan has so warped you right now, but I want to put you back together again. I want to give you a do-over. I want to recreate you. And I want to help you right now. And so what I'm about to give to you is coming from a heart of a very loving God who while himself never fully experienced a disheartenment, he did love people and he knew where you were at. And then number two, and if this means anything to any of you, I don't know, but I really love you. And all of us have these tendencies And I I don't want anyone to quit something that they shouldn't quit. And I don't want you to quit when you want to quit. You don't want to quit one day sooner than God wants you to. But you also don't want to stay one day longer than God wants you to. So what I want to submit to you, some biblical principles now, that you can lean into God's word and you take to the Lord to see where you are if you're feeling about quitting something. Number one, rest from your labor. Rest from your labor. Most of us have ever heard of the Ten Commandments. Some of us will use the term Decalogue. Those of you that are Bible scholars know that there are far more than Ten Commandments, but there are ten. Majority of people probably can't even name all ten. They might name, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, and thou shall not have your neighbor's wife or commit adultery. All right? But little of them know that one of the ten talks about the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? Because God designed the Sabbath very significantly. And there's a lot of reasons the Sabbath was designed. And the Sabbath basically means simply this. One day a week that we have a day off. A day off from the basic routines of life, pulling it apart so we can have a sense of quietness, a new routine. And part of those reasons, I believe, is this. Listen carefully. That sometimes when we get working so much doing things, we begin to control so much because we begin to have an attitude of ownership of all of this stuff. And sometimes that's fed because we have an overactive, conscientious spirit. So all of a sudden it becomes ours. And when things start going wrong and we get disillusioned and burned out, we get all off balance. And when God is saying, wait a minute, the only way perhaps for some of you to realize that it's all of me is for you to let go all of it, walk away from it, completely don't touch it, and then let me take over. And I want to show you I can do that. So he told them, forget your animals, forget watering your crops. Forget going out and doing things. I just want you to sit still, in a sense, for a day. 
So those Jewish people had to shut down for a little bit and realize, you know what, life does go on. I didn't have to do this. I didn't have to do that. We took care of the food last night. We got some for today. We're going to be okay. And so that's why I put, biblically, we need to rest from our labor. Let me read you the passage. Just listen as I read God's word to you and let the Spirit speak to us. He says, remember the Sabbath. Oh, by the way, let me pause for a second. You know why he said remember the Sabbath? Because we so easily, quickly forget the Sabbath, all right? We have a propensity not to remember it, to keep it holy. And the word holy means separate, and usually separate unto God. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Go ahead, work ethic is good, stay busy. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter. And they're hearing that right now and they're saying amen. Nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle. And I could say we don't have servants today, or do we? Microwaves, televisions, other things that we have that kind of help serve us to do things. Stay away from them. Nor your cattle, nor your strangers within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. And he rested. I think he rested more as a model for us. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath. And he set it apart and made it very, very special. You know, the command to rest is just as valid as the command to work. Some of us have been given by our parents and maybe by society or just survival a tremendous work ethic. And maybe God is saying, as good as that is, let me also give you a rest, a biblical rest ethic. Could God be speaking to us today? There was a workaholic on a street corner that had a sign that read, I haven't seen this guy. We'll work for fun. <laughs> and although God wants our work to be fun, he also wants us to enjoy our rest. And I'd like to speak to you for that. It's not something you do to go to heaven. Some people take it and go way farther than what God does. Way off the map. In dangerous territory. But God says, a Sabbath. A day of rest. Number two. He wants us to reduce our workload. Now, this could be a dangerous term for some of you that are already lazy, and I know some people. I know how some of us can get more time during the day, and that is just don't touch the computer. You know, some of us, uh, we get so caught up with stuff. Reduce your workload. Let me read a verse to you, but I would like to show it to you from another angle. It says, so, it says since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And then it says sin. So we know that a weight and a sin is a little different. And so weight could be something we do that is really not really honoring to God. And sometimes we'll talk about what we drink, what we wear, where we go, and all that kind of stuff, which is not too bad. It's bringing us down, keeping our eyes off of the Lord. But I'd also like to throw in there that some of those weights could be that we have such a tremendous desire to stay so busy for whatever reason that we begin now to get so burned out that now we overcorrect and we shut down completely. And so it's saying here we need to reduce our workload. Back in the Old West, some of you that are from the West, I don't know who, how many are here, but do you remember they used to have when they would be branding the cattle, they would try to get these branding iron nice and hot, and so kids don't listen to this, but they take that hot branding and they put it up against the raw hide of that cow, that cattle, and, and they'd burn it. But they had to keep it real hot. But sometimes those cowboys would have so many branding irons because they wanted to get the job done that they would choke out the fire and that's where you got the term too many irons in the fire and now they couldn't complete their job and I think that's really good for us some of us have so many things going I have a Christian leader friend of mine that literally has three computers on his desk uh, under his desk with the, the CPU in his, and then he's got three screens and one is like that big Mac screen that's I don't know the size of a billboard practically you know he's got that thing going 24-7 too many irons in the fire. How careful we need to be. So reduce your workload. But there's another thought. But you want to eliminate the sin load. Some of us feel like quitting. Because what we're trying to do. Watch this. This is really. This is huge. We try to keep our Christian life going. While we try to keep our. 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 our fleshy life going we keep our walk with god thinking we're going here by getting involved in christian activity so we have the disease called christian activity itis going on over here while over here we also want to do things of the world and party with them and let me tell you it's very easy in honolulu when you live up in the mainland somewhere when they have a snowstorm you can't go anywhere the roads are bad can't go anywhere it's cold and damp and yucky outside can't go anywhere so we kind of cocoon at the house and we might be able to have a little bit of here my goodness gracious 
We just can't wait to just throw the boogie board in and go. I mean, this place is beautiful, so we're always kept alive and busy. And so what happens now, we can get so caught up in doing that that sin now takes over. And why we're shutting down is because we have all this going on that's good, but we also have some of the other stuff down, and we are encumbered with too much stuff. So we want to reduce the workload, but we also want to eliminate the sin load. Number three. Simple things that God says that we all probably know, but maybe we haven't applied, and now we're struggling with burnout and wanting to quit. Number three is regulate your schedule. Regulate your schedule. Now, I know that's hard. I have a Palm Pilot. I have a, a Mac screen. I've got a PC screen. I've got two calendars in the church office, one for people that are coming to stay in the building, others for the activities that we have. We have calendar meetings literally once a week with our staff. Carol has two calendars on the refrigerator. She's got one in her purse. I have one that beeps every time I've got to do something or call someone or to know. Isn't this unbelievable? Aren't I a wreck? Aren't I a mess? You know? And so schedules sometimes really drive us. And I have to be very careful for that. So regulate your schedule. Look at the verse. It says this. It says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, it's not saying you can't plan ahead. It's not saying you ought not to be prepared for a meeting and have your agendas together. What it is saying, though, is don't worry about that. Be very careful that we're not encumbering ourselves with more than what God wants us to have. We're putting in ourselves. So watch this, watch this, watch this. We want to serve God our way with all the things we do. And God is saying, no, 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 no. You got too much going on right here. No, no, no I want to do more. No, 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 no. And we got this argument going on with God. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, Let's, let's let me take care of tomorrow. You just take care of today. You center down on what you have right here. I read another story about a lady who was involved in a small boating accident. Everyone perished but her. She finally made it to the beach. When they got to her, she's laying on the beach, kind of just, just dribbling water and so exhausted. And all she was saying was this. One more stroke. Just one more stroke. And I think for some of us, all we have to do is just one more stroke, one more stroke. Don't worry about how far away the beach is. Just take today. What does he want us to do today? I know we've got to have some stuff. Tomorrow, but what does God want us to do today? Let's make sure that we keep today today and not take tomorrow and put it in today. That'll help us. Number four. You know this one. You ought to put a star by this one. I think this one here is the key, the root, the epicenter. Refuel your spirit. Be filled with the spirit. And most of you know, as you read that, you think, be filled with the Spirit. So, oh, that's it. I need to get the Holy Spirit. I live my life. This Holy Spirit kind of leaks out like gas. And all of a sudden, I've got to get the Holy Spirit back again. I've got to get filled with the Spirit. Actually, that's not what it says in the original language. I'm sorry it doesn't say it better in the English. But in the original language, first of all, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. It says, a command. Continually be filled with the Spirit. Now, listen, this is really huge. Which now implies that I will most likely not be continually filled with the Spirit by my choice. The word filled now is the word influenced. So if I want to be influenced by His power, then I have to realize that in order for me to succeed in this world, I can't do it in the flesh. i got to give up and give in to God. Now once I do that, and I do that on a daily basis, and I know I need to be continually filled, then I can be refueled by the Spirit of God. Water wells have to be replenished with water. Batteries have to be recharged. Cars have to be refueled. And you and me, we need to be refueled by the Spirit, by yieldedness to Him on a moment-by-moment basis. I hate earthly illustrations, but maybe this will work for some of you. I don't, I don't know if you drink coffee or not. I don't know if they do this much with tea. I'm not a tea drinker, but I was going to say I'm not a teetotaler, but some of you will take that way farther than I want you to. But have you ever gone to a restaurant and you get your coffee all going, but after you've been talking and having good fellowship, it's half down and it's kind of, kind of you know, lukewarm. What does the waitress usually do? She usually fills it up a little bit more and, oh, it's nice and hot and good again. You like it? Well, God says the same thing with us. As we're busy in our world, there are times that he has to heat us back up again. And what we've got to do is put ourselves underneath the power and the control and the influence of the Spirit. I don't like the illustration because it sounds like we only have half of him and we've got more of him and he leaks out and we're going to get more. I don't like that part. But I do like this part. A continual influence of the Spirit. Well, let me end with the last one here and that is to renew your vision. The verse says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. 
The reason I would like to end with this, because it's going to take some of you to be real mature about who you are as a person. This deals more than just with salvation. So I'd like you to really listen. Can you all listen very carefully to what I'm about to say? A lot of times we want to quit. We have burnout because we are now living our life in a way that um, we don't know why we do what we do. We don't set goals. We don't know what is our purpose in life. Now I know it's to love God and love Him forever and worship Him. I, I know all of that. But on a practical basis, what did God call you to do? Some of you have a particular gift, a different personality. Some of you know where God has called you, what you should do. Jim Dobson knows what he was to do. Chuck Swindoll knows what he was to do. Jim Cook knew what he was called to do. And so once you know what is your main call in life, what do you believe God has called you to do, it makes you have a lot more confidence to say no than for all of us that say yes to everything because we're still trying to figure out who we are. We're trying to find ourselves and we're 60 years old. And so once you know why you're here, you've got to figure that out. You've got to know what's your purpose in life. And you're going to find that a lot of that clutter seems to just kind of fall off the wagon. And now you've got a race, a race car going. Oliver Wendell Holmes, that Chief Justice, we've got some people in law here, so I'm going to use his, his illustration. He was going somewhere in, the condu- in a train in the old days, and so the conductor came by and said to him, said to Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, I need to have your ticket. And the Chief Justice, he, I, I can't find it. I, I don't know where it is. I can't, I can't find it. I can't find it. The conductor was very kind and said, you know what? I won't punch your ticket. That's okay. When you find it, here's my address. You mail it in. That's okay. You, you can go on. Oliver Wendell Holmes says, no, no, no. I need my ticket. He said, no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Relax. Be cool. He said, I need my ticket so I know where I'm going and where to get off. All right? And some of us, we need our ticket to know why we're here and where we're going. Now, here's where it begs. The more of us that authentically, correctly know the book, we then know when we're pushing the envelope, when we're walking outside of our margins. Those who know the book know how to get back within our margins. We know why we should be in our margins. We have the confidence to say no as well as the confidence to say yes. This book right here is a book that does not take away our fun. It enhances our fun. This book is not a joy killer or joy robber. It's a joy giver. This book right here will remove the burnout. But for those of you who don't know Christ as Savior, then you're missing what God has for you as far as the light that He wants to put on and turn on within you. And so I'd like to leave this with you right now. Some of you might be wanting to give up because you've thought, how in the world do I get to heaven? I don't know how to get there. One person says this, another person says, I don't know what, and I'm struggling with where do I go when I die? Well, if that's where you are right now and you want to just give up on life, don't. Because I'm about to tell you how easy it is to go to heaven and to tell you the only way to go there. So here it is, strictly from the Bible. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of his glory. That's everybody here. The Bible says because we've sinned and fallen short of His glory, we'll never go to heaven and we're destined for eternity in a Christless hell. But God quickly comes back to say, but you don't have to go there. You don't have to be good to get into heaven. My son died on the cross to pay your sin debt, rose again from the dead, will give you free heaven as your home. So no good deed you do will get you to heaven. Then he goes on to say, what do we have to do? It's the easiest thing of all. It's probably the easiest work that's not a work. It's the word believe in the right object. He says this, for God so loved the world, that's you. And let's say it this way, for God so loved you who are experiencing burnout, wanting to quit, wanting to give up, but yet somewhere in the back is that spark of wanting to go on. For God so loved you that he gave his only son, that if you would believe in Him as the one who died and rose again, you can have eternal life. Now what you have in your life is Christ is light. He is also power. He is also wisdom. He is also strength. He is also Lord and forgiver of your life by faith alone. So now you have someone who will now guide you through this life so you won't be disillusioned, discouraged, discontent, quit and disassociate 
will now give you a reason to have a Sabbath and the ability to have a Sabbath. For you to know then what you can do by relieving your workload and the power then to eliminate that sin in your life that's hindering you so much from running and finishing the race well. The Spirit of God will be in you and now will have the influencing aspect going on. And you'll have focus because you'll have real reason to live. But you need Christ. He's your rock. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to know that God really loves you. And He sent His Son. And perhaps maybe in a veiled way, when He said when He was on the cross, that this too might pass from me. That He was showing that moment of perhaps not wanting to quit, but knowing how close to the edge someone could get to wanting to quit. And then in all of that, He didn't. He stayed on the cross. He died. He rose again from the dead. And the non-quitter Jesus lives inside of you to give you the wisdom to know how to adjust your schedule and how to live a life that your light never burns out. But you need to trust Christ as your Savior. So why don't you right now, wherever you are, simply say this between you and the Lord. Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I've done things wrong. I know I've wanted to quit. I know I've quit things in the past that maybe I shouldn't have. But I can't undo that. I can't unscramble the egg or unring the bell. That's the past. This is the present. But Lord, I want to go forward in a new life in you. And so now, Lord, I want to thank you for forgiving me of all sin. I want to thank you for giving me new life. I want to thank you for having me with eternal life to be with you. And now, Lord, I'm facing some unsurmountable issues in my home, in my school, in my job, in my career, in my relationships, in my neighborhood. And Lord, I don't want to quit. I don't want to burn out. But I do want your wisdom. I want your strength. As I face these, knowing that you are a stress reliever. And I look to you, believing that you will help me. How many of you today would like to say, Pastor, pray for me because I'm receiving Christ as my Savior, knowing that now He'll give me eternal life, forgive me of my sin, and I want, I want you to pray for me because I know now that I'm in God's forever family. And here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. I'm not going to have you say anything out loud. I'm not going to come down. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I want to know right now if you're going to trust Christ as your Savior, I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone in here that's willing to say, you know what, I was ready to give in and give up, but now I'm going to get right. I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior. Pastor, would you pray for me right now? I'm trusting Him as my forever Savior. Never done it before. I'm doing it now. Would you slip up your hand right now? Is there anyone at all by an uplifted hand that's trusting Christ today? Never done it before. Christians, are you struggling with someone that may want to give up, may want to give in, may want to just cash it all out? Maybe you're one of those right now. Maybe for you, I'd encourage you to go take a Sabbath as much as you can. Just trust God. Just trust Him right now. He, he, he will sort it out with you. He will help you. You want to do it right. You want to do it for His glory. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. So you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Some of you that are in situations where you should quit, but that's where your burnout is. You know you should because this thing that you're involved in is hurting, is wrong, it's not right. And so you're at burnout because you just, you can't give up. I want you to, he'll give you the strength for those of you that need to move on from something that's not right. And it's not hopeless. Don't quit. In a sense, God. I'd like to pray for some of you that are struggling with maybe some issues in the same area. And I don't know the intensity or what area, but you just like to have your pastor just take you to the throne of grace. I'd like to do that. Is there anyone here that God spoke to you today and you now would like for me to pray for you? Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all? God bless you. Many hands, many hands. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message. And it wasn't intended for any specific person by name, but it was intended for every one of us. That, Father, that we would not give up one day sooner than we should, nor should we stay in something that's wrong one day longer than we should. And I pray that, Father, that we will realize that you are the Lord of our life as a Christian. And therefore, Father, that whatever you do, it's going to be well. And we're going to follow you. You're going to give us guidance and strength and our joy back. And so, Lord, I thank you for this faith family. And, Father, I ask a blessing on them while I'm out. And, Father, that you'll bless everyone, the, the guys and the gals, the moms and the dads, the single people, the teenagers, the children. And, Father, protect the little infants that are in our church as well. And that when I come back, I'd be able to hear great and mighty things that you have done in their lives, with their lives, for their lives, as you help them, Father, become more like you. 
guide those that are in positions of leadership, of influence, that, Father, you'll help them as well as they guide and shepherd the flock while I'm away. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.